Ага, Ленка, ти вже тут. Мені шарити презентацію, чи ти пошариш? А, я пошарю, привіт. І тут ми під записом. Я думаю, що Софі потім це все виріже. Я зараз... Добре, я просто шарила. Тут навіть хтось заходив, але потім... Як зайшов, так і вийшов. Ну, у будь-якому випадку, да, Софі до нас приєдналась. Команда Е5 прийшла послухати про Unbarding of Charities, Best Practices, Tips and Tricks. Всім привіт. Це Діана, привіт. Привіт. Ми тут те, що говоримо, ви потім виріжете, окей? Так, окей. Я тоді, я так розумію, не потрібна, я тоді піду. Все, гарного вам вебінару. Ну, чекай, Діана, не спіши. Може, have зараз... Have I think we have other participants here? Так, yes. Good evening. This is your time zone. Couple of minutes past to start. Друга людина докональчується і під'єднується. Вона дивляться, що на хвилину раніше. Це ну, треба буде пару хвилин почекати. So, sounds dirty. It's party time. Hey. Uh, I guess we will wait a couple of minutes for our colleagues to join us. Can we send a notification for those guys who are registered to us? Anyway, uh, in a couple of minutes, we're going to start. Uh, we'll have the recording of this presentation, so you may simply watch it uh, later in case of need. Wait. So guys, I guess we're ready to start. What do you think? Yeah, sure, I guess let's start and I guess it's one minute past the time. So uh, welcome everybody, welcome on our today's call. So today we are going to have our interesting session, guys. Uh, again, quite a lot of uh, people were interested in that before you know we decided on the topic. But we will be talking about the onboarding of our short team, the best practices, tips and tricks. And I hope that we can share you know, our expertise an experience in terms of, you know, um, like doing these processes for our clients, doing this for our teams and collaborating with people worldwide in order to onboard, you know, offshore teams and various setups. But first, let's start from the small introduction. Uh, the company who organized this webinar for you is E5. We're a consulting and training company with uh, up to 10 years experience in these spheres. Uh, our main focus is the child transformation, of course. Also, we may assist you with different consultancy in project management, business analyst, and uh, our goal to decrease your time to market, your product time to market, increase uh, the quality of your products, of course, increase engagement of your teams and productivity. Also, uh, let us introduce ourselves. My name is Helen Lubchak. I am CEO and uh, SAFE consultant at E5. 
and have more than 15 years of experience as delivery manager, the person who is responsible for the delivery of software products. And the uh, past few years, I mostly concentrated on hardware uh, setup, on hardware products, productions, assembly lines. And of course, uh, I'm helping our clients uh, support um, a child transformation as external consultant. All needed certifications are also present, and uh, it allows me actually to share with you not only theory, what is written in the books, however, only also a lot of practice, practical cases here. And my colleague, uh, Roman, you're welcome to yeah. share your Hi experience. Hi, guys. Hi again. Hi, everyone. So my name is Roman Sakharov. I'm also co-founder, trainer, and consultant at our company E5. And I'm also senior director of business analysis at EPAM company. So I do also work for more than I guess, 17 years in you know software industry, working in different roles as a program manager, product manager, business analyst, and uh, um, actually the delivery manager and the, the person who helps our clients to deliver you know their products. So actually, you know, these things we are going to discuss today, we did uh, for several of our clients and I would like to share, you know, how we did it, you know, what questions we were asking ourselves for that to happen. And I hope that, you know, this um, experience will be helpful to you as well. Uh, also, let us uh, introduce a couple of our clients. You may see their logos. Uh, this uh, are only a few of them, and you may see that uh, we are helping uh, very different companies. Um, they may be soft with software product, with hardware product, or even a non-IT company like uh, Good Wine, the largest importer of uh, wine in Ukraine, or uh, retail companies. Um, uh, medical software as well with different hardware devices here. Uh, so our experience is very wide and uh, we're really able to provide you different cases with a variety of different business domains. Yeah, guys. And uh, again, I would love, we would like to ask you to share, you know, your location, your role, and maybe your current offshore challenge in our chat. So we can also read it to you, you know, and uh, read it aloud. Also, if you are watching this webinar uh, in the recording, do the same as a command to our video. We will also be able, you know, we are usually monitoring all the commands from our videos and we try to engage with you, if, especially if you have any uh, specific challenge, we can suggest you some other materials which can help you in your specific challenge. Uh, so guys, yeah, just maybe a couple of seconds, your location, your role, and your current offshoring challenge, if there is any, or maybe you are just trying to understand how it generally works. So, and uh, while you're answering, I think we can proceed. And uh, yeah, we can actually discuss our today's agenda. And again, while you will be answering, uh, we will uh, share these answers with you as well. So I see Arthur, he has mentioned that he is from Warsaw. Uh, Warsaw and he is an IT admin. So again, because for administrations, as admins, it's also quite important to understand how offshoring works because this is one of the, my guess, key, you know, activities which can be easily offshore. Uh, so today we are going to have uh, our discussion about actual offshore teams. Why? So why would your company, why would your organization want to consider offshoring as an option? Uh, the other part, we will talk about going offshore how, so how actually that works and what you need to do for that to happen. So first of all, of course, you need to do the organizational analysis, and then you need to organize the process of actually moving your teams to offshore. And then we'll proceed with some conclusions and we'll have a chance to uh, Q&A as well. So... Uh, that's the thing. Also, you are free to post your questions in chat while we are discussing. Yeah, because it's going to be it, it will allow us to be more interactive and to address your specific questions during the webinar. Uh, also, I see Arthur is also asking in the chat, will the recording be available and where? So we will definitely uh, circulate it after the webinar. We will send it to your registered email so you'll be able to watch it later. Also, it will be available on our YouTube channel. And I think yeah, we can share the link to our YouTube channel, channel as well. Uh, 
So, and um, yeah, let's start, guys. So let's start, start with the question, why, right? Why would you want to consider offshoring in general? I mean, sometimes it's obvious, sometimes it's not. But yeah, but let's start with that. Uh, so why would we consider offshoring? So we all know that we are still in the recession, right? So we are the global economy is still not growing. And the IT market and software markets, they are still, you know, under quite a serious challenge. So that's why a lot of technology companies, you know, large companies, they are considering cost optimization quite actively. And what is one of the key ways of, to cost optimize? Of course, is to go offshore. Uh, but that's, of course, not all the reasons, you know, to go offshore. Sometimes you might need the fall of the sun uh, approach, like, uh, like Arthur mentioned, if you are doing uh, support. Or it can be like some unique skills which you do not have in your location, like data, cloud, artificial intelligence, machine learning, or anything with that direction. And also, guys, we will be uh, sharing a couple of interesting insights from the Deloitte report uh, on the shared services and how actually they, um, you know, surveyed their audience on how um, outsourcing and offshore setups work. So, and this is just quite, you know, a recent survey of 2023, where we can see that out of those 76, um, again, uh, companies that are considering shared, shared services centers, um, existing locations will be used by 55%. Yeah, but also we have quite a lot of, um, uh, yeah, locations considering, uh, sorry, not locations, but companies considering new locations, right? And first of the reasons is to pursue the lower cost or to access the talent. And there are, of course, some other reasons which we can check on the next slide. Uh, basically, we are also, you know, there are multiple reasons behind the reason behind your offshoring decision, you know? And here is also, you know, the um, other part of the survey, which says, why would we want to go offshoring, you know, and what is impacting our actual footprint strategy? And as we see here on the first place is talent availability, right? So it's much easier to find talents in some markets, but of course, it much, can be much more cheap for us to get talents in some specific geographies. Uh, of course, there are some geopolitical situation, you know, or market situations for our um, business centers. So that's kind of the reasons can, that can be there for you to start considering offshoring. And if you have decided that, let's move and see what, what is it, what is there for us there, right? So how can we actually proceed with this process of going offshore and what you need to know as a manager, as a professional to basically go offshore? And on the next slide, you can see that, uh, yeah, that uh, going offshore starts with a simple checklist. Uh, I think we just constructed with Helen uh, this checklist for you and we'll be using it for our today's discussion. So we need to start with your organizational analysis, right? Before actually, you know, going into offshoring, you need to understand why you need to do that, all right? And what goals, what specific goals are you pursuing for that? And actually analyze your scope of that, right? how and what you will offshore, countries you will offshore to, what are the security and legal uh, implication to that? And actually what is the, the uh, business model behind that? And the second part, after you did your due diligence, you did your homework, you can actually organize the process. And this is where you know, you're actually moving or creating your offshore team by selecting the right partner or a manager, launching your team and monitoring the progress and process of that uh, activity. And let's start from the item number one, which is actually conducting organizational analysis. And um, uh, to do that, you basically need to define business objectives. Uh, yeah, and can we please switch to the next slide? Uh, yeah. And one more comment from my side here. So I see uh, that a lot of people here on this webinar also may represent offshore team. And for you, it's also crucial to understand the logic uh, with your client 
what uh, must be taken, what actually analysis must be uh, done, the homework on client side before launching uh, the offshore team. So this information is also very helpful for you to understand better your client, your partners and uh, become the better partner for yourself. Yep, yep, totally true. Thank you, Helen. Um, yeah, and again, the first part, as we as we mentioned already, is uh, organizational analysis. So you need to define your business objectives. So that's always, you know, whatever you do, whether you are building a product, you are building a new department, like any activity you are taking in your company, should start from a business objective. So of course, the same is important here, right? What specific goals and objectives are you trying to achieve through the offshore team, right? And as already mentioned, this can be like that you don't have enough professionals, you want to optimize your costs, or you need to enter a new market, right? And here is also a part of that um, survey that I already mentioned today. So which of the objectives have we achieved through your um, organization, right, when you are trying to offshore? And as we see, reducing cost is traditionally in the first place. And standardization and efficiency of process, developing capabilities and driving business value are the next that are coming after, after the one. And guys, I actually left you the link to that, um, uh, to that study uh, on one of the first slides. So you can check the slides later and actually read through the report. It's, it's quite, quite insightful, I would say. So, and the second step here would be actually... Yeah, Helen, would you like to add anything? Just feel free to jump in because I'm pretty quick, you know, in mentioning what I'm saying. Uh, uh, yeah, so we will jump to this uh, part. And here, of course, um, like once we defined the objective, why we're going to launch this team, what goals we have, uh, the next step will be to discuss internally as a company, the scope and the team. Uh, here you may see a couple of questions. They're more like coaching questions for offshore partner and uh, for actually uh, main company uh, to ask themselves, uh, what about our team? What functions would we like to delegate? Maybe a couple of words about our budget. Do we have any limits? Of course we have because any business has uh, budget limits. Um, some question about recruiting policy. Uh, should we go and hire by ourselves necessary people or we would like to find some partner here? Then the performance, how we go, uh, how we are going to measure it, uh, some KPIs or OKRs, or maybe uh, we would like to measure teams' uh, performance like velocity in some units, mandates, or story points, whatever else you would love to. However, all those questions, they should uh, uh, make you feel more comfortable in your cooperation process. And of course, uh, make it uh, smoothly and cover a lot of different questions. Yep, guys. And the other part of that is, of course, analyzing the countries you are offshore. Because, of course, you know, like defin defining the proper country is kind of a key step here when you are going offshore. Because, you know, there is a real wide selection of, you know, offshoring countries that can, you know, span from Latin America to like European countries, to Eastern European, or to India, APAC, you know, and so on. So that depends very much on your goals. So, and uh, again, the suggestion from us, and this is how we helped our clients, you know, when we worked with them, how to kind of make this analysis. So usually, usually if you have a pretty large company or you need it to scale, you would start with professional market size. So whether you are actually going to find any professionals that you need on that market. You will also need to analyze the salary and rates which are present for that market. Because obviously, as we've seen, usually this is done for cost optimization and you need to understand how much it's gonna cost you. Uh, the other part, which also might be sometimes overseen, but is very important is key competitors in that market. So you need to know who is also playing with you on that market. Because sometimes if you just need, you know, large volumes of professionals on some specific market and you have a lot of other companies working this like trying to look for the same professionals yeah definitely it makes your job harder 
Uh, after that, you can actually dive deeper into analysis of the specific country, right? You can check major cities, major universities, the time zone specifics, whether it fits you, you know, your, your main office, and again, check the culture, whether that culture is close to you and whether you have experience working with that and whether you need to do any adjustments uh, to help the culture fit, you know, with your company culture as well, because, you know, sometimes it's also the case. I know that's a pretty tricky question and it's very hard, you know, just to cover it with a couple of words, uh, but yeah, feel free to, to, to throw your comments if you have anything to add. Uh, okay. And um, Igor, by the way, meanwhile, has also commented his part. So Igor mentioned that he's a product owner in Gdansk and uh, his goal is to introduce the offshore team without an NDA. So which can be also quite a challenge, of course, right? Because, you know, introducing the teams without an NDA is a quite risk for almost any company that you would see. But yeah, let's move to legal part. Maybe, you know, uh, Helen will also help us with that part as well. So Helen, back to you. Thanks, Ramana. Uh... That block, uh, this uh, particular block, may be a little bit uh, annoying, and special with such uh, topic as security, legal requirements, and administration. However, uh, taking care uh, about this um, part of cooperation with your new offshore team will definitely help you to make the cooperation better, quicker, and increase the performance. Because uh, the last thing we want to add to our cooperation it's showstopper we cannot start our cooperation because of missing contracts or maybe not signed nda now what to pay attention to of course uh, here will be some special uh, regulatory requirements they really depends on country and once uh, you have chosen necessary country please make sure uh, to check the local requirements here and of course uh, remember about uh, your own um, your home uh, country requirements there also will be different security uh, policies, uh, especially with informational security, because we have two types of it. It may be physical security, like physical office, access to it, and some of clients really demand even uh, limits to physical office for some team. So this is all questions for you as a main company to decide what your requirements will be in terms of informational and physical security to your offshore team. Uh, next question to cover here will be different risks and uh, unexpected emergencies, uh, maybe challenges that may appear. May we prevent them beforehand? discuss it and write in our contracts, agree about uh, service level agreements uh, and all other parts. So this is also a very good uh, chance for us to discuss it and agree on. And of course, uh, the last but not the least will be the timeline, because in one day it's impossible to hire offshore team. And uh, uh, the timeline definitely depends on your recruiting process, on the size of the team. Are you looking for three people or you are looking for 3,000 people? This is completely different timelines. Uh, however, they also will be very helpful uh, to manage your expectations and your case stakeholders' expectations here. So please take this uh, list of different questions at the checklist for you to make sure that you are moving in the right di direction. Yeah, guys, and uh, <clears throat> I guess also very important part, you know, of going offshore is also identifying your business model because basically you can uh, you can start offshore in, in different ways. Some of them are easier, some of them are harder, right? You can partner with a service company, right? You can go outsource. You can actually select an outsource partner and talk to him. You can also partner with fellow. Yeah, and uh, all those um, like different kinds, how you may partner with your uh, offshore team, uh, they will influence on the price, on the cost of that team. They will influence on the level of cooperation and actual level of effort needed from your side. Are you going to manage them directly? And it means that you as a company, uh, as a home company, must provide necessary amount of managers, 
uh, dedicate some time uh, from them or it will be more like a partner relationship and you have external contract and all management part will be covered by your uh, offshore partner there. Yeah. And basically, yeah, and always, you know, you have an option to open an office. You can hire remotely in these days. You, you can skip at, at all, you know, having any offices. You can just start hiring right away in terms of remote hiring. So it also works. It just depends, you know, on how, how many people do you need, you know, and uh, what, you know, volumes of work do you want to really offshore? But you can start, um, you know, you can start small. You can start from basic remote hires, you know, get acquainted with the culture. Then you can try and, you know, partner with some outsource company. And then you can actually, if you are really, you know, satisfied with a specific country, you know, with a specific market on offshore, then you can only uh, invest in opening an actual physical office. So, yeah, and here is also, you know, another interesting report, which you can check from KP KPMG on future of outsourcing, right? So th they do also investigate, you know, different contract types that you can work with uh, on arrangements, you know, on the uh, deal terms, which you can arrange with outsourcing companies. But again, this is not the scope of our today's discussion, but I just thought that that might be useful for you to check uh, in, in, in your spare time. Uh, yeah. Despite, yeah, despite the option that you are going to choose, please remember that each of that option must be evaluated by you. And ideally, you calculate uh, the necessary price for any option, and then you have the better decision making, because you simply may compare pros and cons of different options. They uh, will include price, timeline, effort needed from your side. And of course, that budget includes not only the salary, however, also facilities with office, rent, or maybe co-working or something else. So please calculate very carefully any of those uh, options before making any decisions. Yep. And on the next slide, again, uh, some insights from Deloitte and actually, you know, how they suggest doing it or uh, not suggest, but rather how their um, respondents actually uh, made it in their companies. And for example, how that uh, their company's footprint changed in the last three years we see that 34% expanded the current center. So did they not open anything new? Uh, also, we see that 9% increased outsourcing and 14% opened new centers, kind of new countries. And uh, uh, some of them, again, not a large percent moved services onshore. Uh, also quite important to know that, uh, you know, again, the uh, remote work is here to stay. It's still, it kind of is a very uh, agile and flexible tool when you are considering offshoring, uh, considering, you know, remote work fully can actually help you to enter the market without, you know, huge costs. And again, as you see still like 60% of organizations were increasing uh, the scope of their offshore centers rather than, you know, hiring in their main centers. And of course, fewer organizations, uh, just 4% were looking to backshore their services, which means moving them from offshore to, to back to onshore. Uh, yep. So, and uh, yeah, that's kind of the first parts of analysis. So that's your homework before you actually do, you know, take the decision on going offshore. And then you can actually do start to, uh, you know, if you take the decision, do start to move uh, offshore. And um, of course, the key, I guess, question here is to select the right partner or offshore manager. So this is basically both, you know, and again, there is a, a specter of options here. So you can find this service partner if you're considering a service company. You can promote one of your managers, which will actually also help you to kind of sustain the DNA, right? It will help you to uh, keep the culture of your company in these newly opened uh, offshore uh, centers. Uh, also, you know, sometimes it's a good idea to hire a specific professional in the, com in the country you're offshore into. Uh, because they do know the local culture, they do know the local specifics. And what's more even important, they do already have some network, which might 
make it easier for you to look for the relevant professionals. And of course, there are options like hybrid, for example, at EPAM, uh, we did quite a lot of cases, you know, when we were opening new countries, when we were, you know, uh, having the local manager who was, you know, the person who actually knew the local market. And we also had a global manager who was bringing, you know, the, the, the ideas of the global culture to that location. So yeah, you can, again, you can be flexible here based on your budgets, based on your goals uh, to grow. But let's go into details. So Helen, back to you. Now, once all our objectives are established, we clearly understand what uh, goals we have, uh, what actually requirements we have, what limits, constraints, risk, whatever else. So we really did a great job with our homework, with performing a good analysis here. The next part will be mostly on how. How we're going to organize this process what we as a um, mother company may do in order to make our onboarding of offshore team very smooth process. And here you may see simple roadmap, which typically um, may uh, be present with different teams, despite their onshore or offshore, you may see that they're very log uh, logical um, stages there. And we will discuss each of these stage and provide some recommendations and uh, key insights for you just to manage it. So again, you may use this roadmap with any of your new team, or maybe you may evaluate your current team and uh, find yourself on one of these uh, stages on this roadmap. So let's start with the first stage, which is actually pre-boarding. This part is like setting the stage. This is our preparation before we are going uh, to launch uh, these new teams. Uh, here is very important for us uh, to set the goals for that particular team. Uh, just to give you an example and uh, actually to provide you more cases from our experience, uh, with one of our clients, uh, we discovered that they had very clear understanding of uh, offshore team uh, goals, why they have uh, this team established, what they want to achieve. However, the communication process uh, of those goals to that particular offshore team was very messy. As a result, the team was started, however, without proper communication and without uh, transferring goals to them. At the end and the result, uh, they wasted a couple of weeks before they identified this room for improvement and actually communicated the goal. So here on the first stage of the pre-boarding, please make sure that uh, you have these goals for your particular team. Maybe you have a couple of such teams or even more. And they clearly communicate to that teams, people aware, what do you expect from them? Uh, also team composition. This is another uh, very tricky moment. It's very easy to say, I need developers. But let's discuss what exactly developers, what programming languages, or maybe what goals you have for them, what our team composition should be. And that topic definitely must be covered with your plans. Do you have your pro uh, product backlog? What about your product vision? How this vision is uh, in line with your team composition? So that part is also the first stage when we're preparing for launching our team. And the last but not the least, this is about methodology. How you're going to work? Will it be classical Scrum? or maybe Kanban, or you would like to use your own methodology, which is also uh, the point for you. Or maybe you're working with uh, some specific, uh, for example, marketing domain, and uh, you have uh, not uh, software developers there, or you have a hardware component, uh, embedded uh, part, or any other. This is all required uh, special methodology and uh, it also must be decided on our pre-boarding stage. So this is for you the key insights to cover before you are going to say, so this is our first day and we're going to uh, start here. And of course, uh, admin part. Uh, so here, make sure that you have a proper paperwork done 
it really depends on your partner, on the country, and may vary a little bit. Uh, access. Uh, it's very, you know, like simple thing to provide um, mail access, maybe communication channel like Slack, Skype, Microsoft Teams, whatever else you would want uh, to use. However, everything must be prepared before your teams uh, are going to have the first working day. Of course, facilities, how they're going to work. Will uh, they have special office or maybe room or this is all covered by your partner, your offshore partner, then your life will be much simpler here. And this is the benefit of working with uh, offshore partner. Uh, and providing the professional hardware um, like laptop or maybe a headset or anything else needed uh, for your teams. So this is our preparation, preparing the stage before our teams are going to start. Uh, the next stage here will be the first days. Now, we're very excited. Our teams just launched it. We have the first good impression. Typically, they are pretty good because uh, we're all excited to start new ideas, new product development, and uh, have uh, new goals here. For us, uh, as a mother company, it's crucial to support this uh, engagement, support this positive vibe, and make sure that we may start as uh, soon as possible to the work, to the working tasks and goals. Uh, this is a good uh, time for us uh, to kick off the introduction meetings, uh, get familiar with each other, maybe conduct some informal communication like hobby or maybe um, uh, pets or anything else. Of course, uh, here we must define our working process. Uh, do we have any uh, scheduled meetings? Are we going to schedule them? How we're going to communicate? What our policies? Uh, what our software development life cycle or service level agreements for this particular team? This is all must be communicated again for this team and for managers on um, onshore side. Um, maybe you would like to have this uh, Sprint Zero practice or uh, any other activities. And of course, be ready that you as a mother company are going to spend more time on this stage because your offshore team definitely requires uh, managerial support at this stage. Uh, this is like our main uh, focus uh, to be implemented. Third stage. We are pretty good, we got our goals, we agreed on our uh, team charter or any other group activities and real work started. So uh, third stage integration, when we have first weeks of work, uh, we may be not very excited with the la uh, launch of new products and projects. Uh, however, here, this is a good stage when we have the first working results. And here we must check them. Are they in line with our expectations, which we had? Or maybe mm, they are lower, maybe higher, or we may adjust them somehow. In case uh, if our planned versus actual results are different, this is a good point to adjust it and communicate as early as possible. And please do not forget about classic. Classic project um, project management when we have iron triangle. Here, the good place again to check uh, the scope, what we are going to deliver, budget, uh, what typical composition we have, are we in line with our budget or no, and of course, schedule. So, this is all for us to check. The first stage. Um, this stage typically uh, appeared in first month, so maybe you have worked for months or longer, and uh, this is uh, the time when we have uh, real results, so they already adjusted, and this is a good place for us to conduct the team buildings, um, to celebrate uh, some short wins, celebrate the results, provide the feedback, maybe adapt delivery roadmap, because uh, 
it may very vary our speed, the speed of our teams, the expectations, the scope. So please do not forget to adapt your roadmaps uh, as well and manage expectations of your case stakeholders. And unfortunately, this uh, yeah, on this stage, um, very often we see the conflicts. Uh, they may be hidden, they may be active, uh, or they may be not the conflicts, uh, rather disagreements. You may just simply notice that cooperation inside your teams are not uh, such good and smooth as you would like to have. What is happening? Uh, here we would like to remind you or maybe introduce, if you're not familiar with Pac-Man model. By the way, uh, could you please uh, type plus if you're very familiar with Tuckman model or minus if it's completely new tool for you. So we will spend a little bit more time on uh, explanation of this model. Uh, your feedback is really appreciated here. Mm -hmm. I see like uh, some of our um, participants are familiar with it. So for everybody else. Please put plus or minus for us to understand um, the level of details which must be provided for you. Um, anyway, for those of you who are uh, not familiar with this model, this is uh, pretty um, well known for the managerial uh, topics model, which provides us group dynamic. Uh, the original Tuckman model uh, provided by Bruce Tuckman uh, ended on here on performing stage. Uh, his students introduced a new version with the fifth uh, stage of a jury. Let's do a short overview of this model. So once we mm, just formed our team, we launched them as uh, really the group of people with common goal. Uh, the first uh, stage uh, they're facing with is forming. On this stage, uh, people typically very polite. Uh, we're trying uh, to be nice, to get familiar, understand what's happening. And on this stage, the performance of our team is equal uh, to performance of uh, each of our individual uh, person. So they're pretty the same. Once we uh, got familiar with each other, we are moving to the storming stage. And this is the stage of the conflict. When we are trying to check our borders, what is allowed here? Can I say something rude? Can I scream or something like that? Or maybe it's not allowed in this team. What are our rules? So uh, all those uh, actually conflicts typically appear uh, on storming stage. And for you as a manager or as a mother company who pays attention to it, the crucial on the storming stage to provide maximum support, to provide maximum managerial effort in order to move your team from the storming stage to the norming. How it's possible? by providing rules, recommendations, instruction, by doing team buildings, uh, by spending more time on common goal, by forming your team. Once it's done, your team will move to the norming stage. On this stage, team will um, introduce their own rules. They already decided what is rude, what is not rude, how they're going to work, uh, what is okay in this particular team and what is required uh, corrections here. And after norming, they're moving to the performing. This stage is uh, has this effect of synergy. When we have the formula one plus one equal to three, when the performance of each particular individual in this team is lower to the team's performance in general, and uh, the managerial goal to move your team as soon as possible from forming storming to this performing stage. The latest version of adjuring are introducing um, the stage when the goals are achieved and there is no any sense for this team to be uh, here. Uh, in such case, uh, the mm, management uh, task will be uh, to provide this team another goals or maybe change this team. Uh, just uh, move the people to another teams with another project or another uh, goals. 
So uh, coming back to our uh, stage number four with assimilation, the first months, please keep in mind that here you will face a lot of storming. Of course, there may be that um, your team will have the storming even on the third stage, but typically it's most like at least a month uh, should be here. And uh, uh, your task will be make sure that your storming stage are moving to the norming uh, by having enough recommendations, uh, instructions, uh, team charter, team buildings, and of course, common goal, very clear cooperation process and resolving the conflicts here. The last but not the least, once we establish our team, please do not forget about inspect and adapt. This is evaluation and long-term long development. Uh, we have PDCA cycle from Lean, plan, do, check, and adjust. And this is our time to check and to adjust. Should we use the same process or maybe we should adjust it somehow? Add retrospective or maybe remove some unnecessary meetings. This is all good questions for us to make our team's life better and actually our teams be more productive. This is all the time uh, to pay more attention for long-term development, for the strategy, for people management and strategic growth plans adjustment as well. So this roadmap, again, may be used for any team and we highly recommend it to use special for offshore team to make sure that uh, you cover all necessary stages and your team will be on performing stage as soon as possible. Yeah, guys, and a couple of things I just wanted to mention on this slide. You know, when you are launching your team and you're actually on the stage that your team is working for some time, this is, again, this is not specific for, uh, I would say, even an offshore team. Usually you will face these challenges with teams, even, you know, with your close teams. But again, uh, based again on the same survey from Deloitte, uh, they are actually, you know, asking their respondents on uh, you know on on this offshore survey so what are the challenges there and we see upskilling you know well-being uh, market adjusted compensation alternative career passes are the key challenges there and again these are connected with career progression that you know there is a high turnover and increased labor costs you know because people want to get paid more as soon as you know as they bring more value to the company as well so again you can check it but i really like those pretty interesting insights in terms of this uh, um, uh paper okay and um yeah let's move uh further alan back to you yeah so um we are moving closer to the end of our webinar and of course in terms of offshore team yeah, I would like to highlight the last uh, step here, but not the least, it's about progress and adaptation. Once your teams uh, are launched, each three uh, or six months, or even more often, it really depends, but at least once per quarter, you should review your process. Maybe something uh, is needed uh, simply delayed something is needed to be added or uh, there are some uh, outdated ways of working or maybe missed uh, parts. Uh, very uh, good practice here will be uh, check your metrics. You may use OKR, Objective K results, uh, very inspiring practice, or maybe some static uh, KPIs, K performance indicators for some direction. They all must be monitored, and for us, it's crucial to understand the dynamic. Are we moving in the right direction or no? Or we should adjust it here. Gather the feedback, especially from your case stakeholders. Uh, ask your teams how they are doing. Ask your managers inside your company what our performance, our main goals and objectives for our offshore teams. Are we on good track or we need uh, to correct something here? And of course, PNL uh, report here is very uh, also very interesting because one of the main reasons, uh, as uh, Roman mentioned at the beginning of our webinar, it's reducing of cost. 
Uh, and uh, here you should check uh, those ideas with offshore teams. What about your current PNL? Is it worth uh, to spend such effort on managing of uh, offshore team? Or maybe we should correct something or adjust or make the negotiations with our partner and uh, brainstorm and find good solution for both companies. Yeah, guys. And again, in terms of our today's conclusions, while we are closing uh, to the end. So first of all, as we always mentioned, you know, in any change or business activity, you need to start with clear objectives for the offshore team. You need to understand why you're actually doing that. You know, it's not just, of course, just trying it out or trying to have a couple of people because you found them there. Uh, Usually, having an offshore team will help you to scale and optimize your business most of the time. Yes, it will generate some management overhead, but again, it will also allow you to optimize your costs and again, expand your footprint you know, and expand your ability to get professionals of this, in the specific area. The Tuckman model, as Helen mentioned, it's very important, right? You need to consider it. When you will be hiring people and you know they will be starting to work together, it's like... It's not going anywhere, right? It's still there. This is how we function as humans. And that's still there. And you need to consider that as a manager. And the final part is, of course, you need to imply, expect, and adapt on the every every aspect you know of this offshoring process. And again, we kind of focus today more on the team aspect, but obviously there are a lot of legal aspects. There are a lot of you know organizational aspects as well, which you will need also to consider. But again, if you do remember inspect and adapt, that will hugely help you to avoid most of the issues and actually to get the most. Of the of most of the value of uh, the offshoring concept. And if you are the representative of offshore team and you actually the partner for your um, clients, this is a good checklist for you to manage their expectations and with them talk on that topic, uh, clarify the objectives uh, of uh, offshore team and all that stuff that we already discussed. Uh, if you need any assistance in terms of setting up the processes with your offshore team or you have any challenges with cooperation, communication, uh, we're here to help you. Please feel free to book um, the free consultancy uh, session with us uh, where we'll discuss your particular case. And of course, we'll provide you some um, guidance how to manage those challenges and help you to be more proactive. Yeah, guys. And again, if you have any questions after our today's discussion, just feel free to connect to us on LinkedIn. Yeah, it can easily be found. Again, if you're watching the recording or otherwise, you can find us by these QR codes. Just feel free to ask us, you know, that's our job and we'll try to help you. This is a good time to raise your questions uh, and to share maybe some cases. Uh, for us also, we'll be very excited to discuss them. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for your thank you. Uh, here is also uh, very inspiring for us to move with uh, this idea of our webinars. Uh, this is uh, the first uh, uh, webinar in this uh, autumn, so we are going to proceed with this topic and uh, discuss more about uh, agile transformations, why they may fail, and what challenges typically we have here. So we're open to your questions, if any. Yeah, guys, just feel free to ask. Uh, you can unmute you know, and ask the questions. If not, again, uh, we do understand, you know, it's late. So you might have some better things to do on the Tuesday evening. And uh, still feel free to ask, again, questions, you know, after the talk and you'll receive the recording and the presentation uh, later after our presentation. Okay, then thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, have a great uh, evening and thank you for joining us today. Bye-bye, uh, guys. Bye. Thank you, guys. See you. Bye-bye.